Tuesday, uh, December 6th, 2022, meeting to order, uh, Committee on Aging meeting to order. Bobby, would you call the roll, please? Cheryl Hentz resigned. Heidi Basford Kirkhoff is excused. Julie Kiefer? Here. Julie Davids? Bryn Seaman? Here. Pat Eurovitz? Here. Julie Maslowski is excused. Judy Ritchie? Here. Mike Ford? Here. Cynthia Thorpe is excused. Joanne Murphy Spice is absent. Jean Wallerman? Here. Five present. Okay. And everyone has had a copy of the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections? If not, I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. <coughs> I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes approved. Citizen statements, did you have anyone? None. And public comments? None. Okay, then Bren, we'll move right into your uh, presentation. You get what you get on the screen. Um, that being said, though, um, my email is linked in the presentation, um, which you'll get electronically. So certainly reach out to me if you want this. I'm finding that many of my presentations have um, kind of become a directory or a platform for folks who find information in them and find them useful as a bit of a resource guide and then are able to access different things. Um, so to start with, my name is Bryn Seaman. I'm an Older Americans Act consultant with the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources, better known as GWAR because that is a mouthful. Um, and today I just want to share a bit about my new role and what GWAR offers the state of Wisconsin. Um, so as I move forward, woohoo, that worked well. Um, the Older Americans Act is something that I'm learning um, about in greater detail in this new role. Uh, prior to this, I was the Aging Director, APS, and Benefit Specialist Supervisor with our local Winneb Winnebago County Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC, and I don't think I had an appreciation for what all these different funding pots of money meant to our local community and our county. So I, I do appreciate the opportunity to learn a bit of history, so I thought I'd share um, where that comes from and how it affects our community. In 1965, the um, Older Americans Act was passed into law, and every year since, it's been a part of our legislation. And it's a focus on those older adults, 60 years and older, by this definition and standard, about providing dignity, welfare, and helping folks to live in the community for as long as possible. There are four provisions or priority systems of the Older Americans Act. It serves those um, 60 years and older. You'll find as I'm talking about the caregiver programs, which is where I specialize, that actually it is beyond um, just the 60 and older population. And while there's priority given to low income minority and those um, older people who reside in rural areas, there is no asset limit or income test as far as accessing the Older Americans Act funding. Uh, in keeping with the opportunity to provide dignity, the um, opportunity is given to those who participate to contribute versus um, required to pay. So a good example is Meals on Wheels, which is historically a large part of the Older Americans Act and how those funds are used in the community. They aren't to be billed as participants if they're eligible, the 60 year older criteria, but they do have the opportunity to donate or contribute what they would like to. Um, the aging network seems a little confusing, but I tried to streamline it as best as I could within this slide. The federal government each year um, decides on the amount of dollars to be passed on to the individual states. The states then pass it on to the area agencies on aging. And in some states, that's where it ends. Um, those individual area agencies on aging may be the service providers. So if that were the case, GWAR might actually 
be the service provider of some of the programs I'll talk about. But in the state of Wisconsin, we actually then pass the money on further to local agencies. And you would know them best as aging units, sometimes housed out of senior centers, or in the case of Winnebago County and city of Oshkosh residents, how they would access those dollars would be through the Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC. There's three area agencies on aging within the state of Wisconsin. The largest is GWAR, um, supporting seven counties and 11 federally recognized tribes. The two other area agencies on aging are Dane County and Milwaukee County. For really unspoken reasons, they have different um, needs um, and have different governmental structures. So it makes sense that they offer the support um, separate uh, from the rest of the state. This is just really a note to, um, I guess, really emphasize and show that the dollars that get used in the local communities are doing their job. And we know this because every year we're reviewing what's called a three-year plan. Every three years, counties or aging units who receive these funds must complete a three-year aging plan. In some ways, it almost feels like applying for a grant every three years all over again to make sure that you're actually doing what you say. Um, the biggest piece and the biggest component that we would we like to look for is consumer voice and community voice and participation. So this year's uh, three-year cycle goes through 2024. As we approach 2024, you might hear the ADRC give public notice or say, we want to hear from you. We're going to be having this meeting. We need your input on our three-year aging plan. So please be on the lookout for those opportunities. Um, it's all input on how these dollars get spent and um, if it's doing a good job and you've benefited from it that's also very important to share because a lot of that data and feedback can work its way up the chain too and show the the work on, at a state and national level what our dollars are doing so I'm talking a lot about Older Americans Act and the programs, and that's all good and well, but you're probably wondering, well, what does that mean for me? How do I know this exists? How do I see it in my community? The biggest way that I think you probably see it or feel it or know people who benefit from it, or maybe you benefit from it yourself, are the um, programs here in Wisconsin, I'm sorry, in Winnebago County, um, the nutrition meals, which would be the congregate meal sites and the home delivered meals, are a shared partnership with Advocap. So you may see that they host the congregate meal sites or their vehicles around the community providing those home delivered meals. That's how Winnebago County offers their Older Americans Act through their no nutrition program, is that partnership with Advocap. Um, they all have different names, so don't get too confused. You'll see here on the slide, I labeled it par Title III Part D, um, but really what that's known as is disease prevention and health promotion. And it's too bad that Joanne wasn't here today because she is that partner. So that's what Joanne does, and that's how her and I work, worked very closely together, and we still continue as um, her work as the Wellness Plus coordinator is taking these Older Americans Act dollars for those programs and those classes and giving it back to the community, helping to train facilitators. And much of those dollars are seed money. So they don't go to fund everything that actually we need. She also has the added responsibility, as do all the other aging units, to find partnerships, donations, hospital systems, and others to help contribute financially to make sure that these classes continue. You'll also see there that Part B, support services and senior centers, are a different pot of money that go to support the senior centers, but also to um, help individuals who maybe don't benefit from the other programs, the nutrition as an example, or the classes, or the caregiver programs, which I'll chat about. Maybe it's just an older adult, 60 years and older, who needs um, transportation support. Maybe they need funding for in-home care, for chore services, or assistance for bathing. Um, Title III Part B grant dollars can be used for that. And then last but certainly not least is my area of expertise. I'm only newer to my role about a year in, but 
um, certainly feel like I have um, quite a bit of information now in the world of family caregiving, and that is um, the pot of money that's given to those aging units here again in Winnebago County, that's the ADRC, and then you're able to enroll in that program. And here's what this means for you. Um, there's lots of definitions of what a family caregiver is. I like this definition because it's very broad and I think the makeup of our family unit and who we would describe as family is ever changing. And we want these dollars to go to people who maybe have a sense of family that's beyond um, what people might typically guess to be the family. So it's defined as a relative, partner, friend or neighbor who has a significant personal relationship with and provides a broad range of assistance for an older adult or an adult or child with a chronic or disabling condition. So many times I think the folks who access the family caregiver grant programs uh, most frequently might be the spouse who has just learned of a newly di uh, diagnosed um, other spouse, loving care partner, who now they're beginning the family journey. Um, or another case would be somebody who has maybe an acute condition, cancer, stroke, something to that um, effect, uh, maybe long term, maybe short term, but those disabling conditions then just propel the family caregiver into that role. They're taking on additional tasks, they're helping to do for others what they once had done for themselves. In the state of Wisconsin, I think we're very lucky and I think it's, it should really be a crowning jewel for us to recognize that long before the National Family Caregiver Support Program was part of the Older Americans Act in the year 2000, um, 15 years earlier, in fact, in 1985, we established as a state um, admin code 68, which is the Alzheimer's and Family Caregiver Support Program. I put these programs in bold because if you call the ADRC, um, I think in our professional lingo, we tend to use the acronyms, though we try not to. But if this is something you're interested in for yourself or somebody else, oftentimes they're called AFCSP and NFCSP programs. This is, I think, an excellent quote that I came across from my predecessor when she was putting together uh, presentations for the community and I thought it very fitting. Uh, there are four kinds of people in this world, shared uh, Rosalind Carter, who's our former first lady activist and writer. She said there are those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. And I think if you, reflect in your life's journey thus far, you likely have had at least one experience as either needing the care from somebody, providing the care maybe for an aging parent or an in-law, um, maybe a sibling, or you can anticipate that there's going to be that need in the future. So certainly this affects all of us and sometimes multiple times. We can be caregivers throughout our lifespan. These are estimates pre-pandemic, so I'm positive that they are far more th um, currently than what this shows, uh, yet um, I don't yet have those numbers, so certainly in the future I will incorporate those um, as we get them. But right now, um, AARP offers that there are over half a million, 580,000 people, in fact, that are active family caregivers. And that shows that they're providing an equivalent of $7 billion of free services annually. $7 billion is more than Wisconsin's Medicaid system. This is more than your family care or your IRIS programs that you might hear about. This is more than your Medicaid fee-for-service. I think that's um, a tremendous number to really highlight what family caregivers do in our state and typically do unrecognized and unsupported. Um, many of those same family caregivers are working, like you and me. So they're caring for their children, they're doing their typical parent responsibilities, and they may also be caregivers for, again, an aging parent, another loved one, maybe a spouse, um, an in-law, or something like that. So there's a lot to juggle. And then uh, nationally, the upward trend is that there's 75% of caregivers as female, and more recent statistics show that um, an increasing number are minority female women. 
So if the sentiment of, you know, Rosalind Carter's quotes or kind of shaping your own experience and pulling from what you may have lived, here are some really good, hard, concrete statistics, especially for those who are very fiscal focused or need that data. Um, one in five Wisconsinites are family caregivers. And I found this ast astonishing, that 80% of all care in Wisconsin is provided by the families. So while we all know well and good that the professional carers who are in home and um, hospice and home health agencies, assisted living and nursing homes are necessary, that they're vital, what we also probably haven't given enough um, support or recognition to is that the families are also doing this and doing 80% of it, in fact. Um, so part of my work as an older Americans Act consultant is not only being that technical support to the counties, but highlighting this economic impact to promote further advocacy efforts. Um, family caregivers can benefit from family caregiver tax credits. Um, paid medical leave instead of just medical leave. Also here in the state of Wisconsin, we're one of just a few, less than 10 actually in the nation who don't have something called the CARE Act, which is really just the requirements of the healthcare systems to identify and then include family caregivers as part of hospitalization and discharge for their loved one. Um, so the more that we're able to promote the voice of family caregivers, not only the more money do we get to um, offset their um, roles and responsibilities, but it, it's self-feeding. It's mutually beneficial. What I mean by that is if you support a family caregiver, you're also supporting economically our nation in the long run and doing so because family caregivers then are getting the help, hospitalization, and health care that they need, getting rest and uh, break that they need, therefore providing better care to their loved one. Uh, this is AFCSP. I broke it down into different criteria that's required. AFCSP being an Alzheimer's and Family Caregiver Support Program does require the diagnosis of some type of irreversible dementia to qualify. And there is um, an asset or income limit within AFCSP. Um, re just a quick reminder, AFCSP is the state specific one where the National Family Caregiver Program is the nation one which doesn't have those um, asset limits or income requirements. Uh, also I like to point out that counties do an excellent job of trying to make those dollars stretch and sometimes that still means despite their best efforts there are waiting lists. So if you in theory um, find that you have a spouse um, who's requiring more and more care because of a diagnosis or illness and you're curious about what supports could be offered to you, you contact our local ADRC here at Winnebago County. Um, I don't believe they have a wait list. Um, I don't think many counties do, but that may be some of the information that you're provided with. You know, here we can give you this information, we can um, look here, we can give you this, but currently we have a wait list for the caregiver programs and you know, you're next on the list. Those types of conversations can happen. I already talked about the eligibility for AFCSP. Um, NFCSP and AFCSP, provide most of the same services. Um, respite is the biggest. That's why I bolded it on this slide. Respite really being a short-term, intermittent, um, periodic break for the caregiver. I think lots of people mean think that that means um, somebody comes to their home, watches their loved one so they can get out and maybe go have a massage, wouldn't that be great? Or go to the grocery store. But respite care can look very different for some people. If just getting comfortable with somebody in the home um, that's new to you is um, your respite where maybe they're having some time in the living room together while you're doing laundry and catching up on other things. That too can be respite. Um, respite can look very different for very different people. Sometimes too, it's just getting in sleep. I've heard of caregiver stories where because they can't have a consistent seven or eight hours, they're just running, you know, ragged and they're exhausted. So um, adult daycare or other types of respite service may mean that their loved one goes out and has an engaging afternoon or a day out of the home, allowing them to have the house to themselves and time to themselves and, and catch up on some sleep.
Uh, and FCSP is much broader as far as eligibility requirements. Anybody 18 or older can actually benefit from an Older Americans Act program, which seems a bit ironic, but that 18 year um, or older adults would be caring for someone 60 or older or somebody with a diagnosis of early onset dementia. Um, so we recognize that even though Older Americans Act dollars might be going to somebody 18, 19, 20 year old, the reason it's going to that adult is because it's indirectly benefiting the care of a loved one who meets the Older Americans Act criteria. There's two other elements of NFCSP that I like to spend some time on because it's actually my goal to share um, more widely that this is an offering to people who may not recognize they fall in this group, and that is to our caregivers who are 55 or older. So if you're somebody 55 or older and caring for a child, um, a relative child under the age of 19, we see this most often within kinship care or um, increasingly with grandparents, aunts, uncles raising um, their niece, nephew, grandchild, um, they too would be eligible for these caregiver programs through NFCSP. The other are those caregivers 55 and older who have a relative disabled adult. That could be um, a child or another person that they're primary caregiver for between the ages of 19 and 59. We most frequently see this with families where the parents have acted as the primary caregiver throughout a kiddo's life. And then as they're um, aging into young adulthood, um, parents may still remain the primary caregiver. And this would be the program that those situations would apply to and could help. These are links, and I failed to mention that on the first slide too, I did link in uh, the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources website. Um, here too, in green, you'll see that these are links to resources. As I mentioned, respite care is the most widely needed and used service that's available through these family caregiver programs. So I've included how to access them and how to learn more about them. Of course, top of the list is the ADRC. There's also the Wisconsin's Family Caregiver Support Program website. I, um, behind the scenes, actually help manage that. There is a plethora of resources, specifically virtual and telephonic caregiver support programs. Anonymity is important to some people, so they don't necessarily want to be in person or maybe locally within their community participating in caregiver support groups. So they might telephonically participate in one that's several counties away, even states away. There's, there's national caregiver support programs too that are a part of that resource list. Also, the Respite Care Association of Wisconsin has grant programs that allow caregivers to be paid or to seek caregivers who've gone through formal uh, training through their caregiver registry. Um, I mentioned the caregiver support groups already. Most of you have probably heard of the Alzheimer's Association that offers 24 hours, seven days a week assistance. And then new within the past few years in a partnership with AARP, United Way 211 is offering caregiver specialist support. And this is one-on-one -on -one, um, supported, supportive li listening sessions where a trained professional is um, providing a type of counseling and support but also um, helping you to connect to community resources. So if housing is an issue as a caregiver, if transportation is an issue as a caregiver, if employment is an issue as a caregiver, um, she is able to connect you to those different things specific within your community. I also threw up um, the Wisconsin Adult Day Center link so that if folks are interested in learning about what might be available in their community, um, you can click on that. These last two slides, I'll breeze through quickly. This is again, just another list of resources. I won't go through any other on this slide except for the top one. If you don't already, please at least take a peek or potentially follow our Wisconsin Family Caregiver Facebook page. Um, it is specific to family caregivers. However, 
that also can pertain to many of us. So there's heating assistance resources, um, information that might be related to local legislation, advocacy efforts. Sometimes we just post, you know, happy memes or smiles, something to um, brighten somebody's day, especially if they're living the day of a caregiver, which tends to be stressful. Um, lots of webinar opportunities as well. So please check it out. And lastly, this is, again, part of my advocacy role. Right now, we have a less than five minute long survey that we're asking any fa family caregivers to complete if they've been involved in a hospital discharge. Um, I mentioned that the CARE Act is um, in over 40 states within the nation. Wisconsin is not one of them. And um, that is, again, identifying a family caregiver and including them in part of the discharge process. So we have lots of statistics and data to show that incorporating family caregivers is a positive outcome. That means for them, they're less stressed, they're more trained, the individual doesn't return to the hospital. Um, so there's healthier outcomes, but we don't have the personal stories. So we are currently conducting the survey to get some more detail and then reaching out to folks if they're comfortable with it um, to see if there's any written or audio or video testimony that they're able to provide. That's it. That was a lot, but I think um, I was able to share a, a bit about what's available to the community through family caregiver grant dollars. Are there any questions or feedback? I guess, what are the consequences of us not having the CARE Act here? Um, you know, it's an excellent question because right now I've been asking the states that do have it, how do they reinforce it? So is there any type of regulation for the hospitals and um, any ramifications or corrective action? And there isn't. Um, so to your question, say it again so I answer. What are the consequences of us not having it? So by not having it within healthcare systems, frequently what we're hearing is that families aren't being identified as an important part of the discharge process. So they aren't receiving proper training. Um, even something as simple as transportation, being coordinated from the hospital. You might have your mom there who's had a fall and you're the primary caregiver, the one that's gonna be taking care of her on her recovery, picking up her prescriptions, trying to coordinate service. But then you get a call in, that says in five hours, she's gonna be discharged. Well, you didn't know that this was, you know, along the way that this was gonna be the discharge plan, the discharge date, and now you're just even trying to scramble how to get her from point A to point B. Um, so there's the inconvenience piece, there's the lack of quality care piece, and then more and more there's the readmission piece, which is incredibly costly to the um, healthcare and hospital systems. If daughter in that said situation doesn't know how to properly care for mom, whether it's transferring appropriately, giving her the proper medication, doing wound care, she then goes right back to urgent care or the ER and that just um, increased costs for care. Mm -hmm. Going along that line, uh, there are individuals who, and I, this is based on a personal experience, individuals are not truthful with the discharge planner, and without the input of family, they're being discharged to a less than desirable, I won't say environment, but situation. Um, they, in the hospital, they're, conf you know, um, compliant with most of what's being asked of them. But as soon as they go home, they're not getting out of bed, they're not eating, they're not keeping hydrated, they're gonna be back in within two or three days. And, you know, greater fall risk. Julie, I know you've seen plenty of stuff going that way. Um, and so having family family, friends, or neighbors that are involved also be involved in that discharge planning or any of this other uh, building on a care plan is really vital. And sometimes it's the expectation of the patient to just go home with those orders, and they don't even think to ask, well, who's going to help me go to the, the bathroom now or 
man, this, you know, I don't know what it's like to be in my home environment with now, a, you know, a, a hip fracture. I don't even know what it's like to need assistance. So they're not necessarily thinking that many steps down the road where a family caregiver or somebody very involved would be. And I'd also like to highlight this is not against any HIPAA regulations. The patient does need to agree to it. So this isn't forced upon care or forced upon invasion of privacy. Um, many times patients want their family or loved one to be a part of their experience so that they have that help in having a proper discharge. And it's those cases when you want to identify and include the family caregiver. My experience, I think one of the problems with finding caregivers is the reimbursement rate. Mm -hmm. It's so low that how do you even, I mean, even kids, high school kids, let's say, can make more money in any other job than they can being a caregiver. You know, it feels like, and not any other job, but most any. places now paying 15, 16, $17 an hour for part-time work. I, I know Levi's reimbursement rate is at the $14 range, and then he's maxed out. So, you know, that, that makes it difficult to really entice someone, let's say, for a summer job. They can make more anywhere, a lot of other places. Absolutely. And then when you don't have the caregiving staff for somebody who ends up picking up the slack is, of course, you as the family and others within. So that just goes to further put a burden and a strain on the family who becomes the informal support then. Um, I, I don't directly work within the world of advocacy and legislation for the paid caregiver workforce. Um, however, I had the great honor of going to one of the counties in the southern part of the state and, and just really sharing some recognition and honoring the um, CNAs and, and other staff that were involved in this long-term care recognition. Um, and you know, they don't earn enough. They aren't recognized for the care that they provide. And until that changes, the best I can do is say that they're valued and tell them my personal experience of how I know that they've changed lives and the important role that they play. Um, and I know that many different assisted livings, nursing homes, in-home agencies are struggling not only to find people, but in, in, and not just to entice them, but come up with creative ways to help make sure that they're they're aware of how recognized and how important they are, because they are. Um, and I, I wish I had more solutions, more dollars to apply to that situation. Um, in my world, I just know that more of those responsibilities fall to family caregivers. And so the more money I can get to support the family caregivers in my work is kind of um, my area of focus. There's only so many dollars, right? And it feels like sometimes we, we struggle over that pot of money, no matter who we are. One of the frightening things that I see, and it's on Facebook, it's on Nextdoor, it's the word of mouth of just looking for a private caregiver and some of the names that are thrown out. And um, these families are not doing any type of background checks mm -hmm. or anything. And if you, especially a couple of them that I've seen lately, when you go on CCAP, they've got a long list of various um, infractions, you know, um, and putting them in the home with a vulnerable person just scares the daylights out of me. Absolutely. And in my job, and, I had seen it. And it scares parents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the fear, right? <laughs> well, back with Meals on Wheels, we had a, a lady from our church, uh, the church that Julie and I belong to, um, who was a retired school teacher, uh, had plenty of assets, and she had a private caregiver, ended up having to go to a nursing home short stay, and when it was time to come home, and I got the phone call, and I said, but she's got an unpaid bill of several months. Well, then, the discharge planner is starting to ask a few more questions, not only of me, but of others. We found out the utility bills hadn't been paid, everything. This private caregiver had not been taking care of all of the duties, but then the bank was also getting a little concerned, more than a little concerned, and found out that this caregiver was stealing 
in more ways than one from that individual. And I mean, that's one of the biggest horror stories. Most um, most of our stories were less than that, but I mean, it was a, a well-known individual in the community th thinking a private caregiver would be better than an agency because she would have more continuity. And, yeah. So I would ha I hate saying this, but um, it's really important for people if they are going to go private to get a background check because um, there are more than you would think people that are privately trying to get into ca caregiving just to get into their medicine cabinets. Sure. A vulnerable population right there at their disposal. Medicine cabinet and or money. Yep. Or the anything that can be sold to, to get more money. I think in addition to um, agencies offering that benefit of screening mm -hmm. who they um, have as their employees, they're also well trained. Um, so there certainly is that benefit. Um, for what it's worth, I did pull up from the resource slide one of the resources, and there are many, so I'm not just trying to promote this one, but when you were talking about independent care and the need to run a background check, um, RCAW, uh, Respite Care Association of Wisconsin, is not the employer of any caregiver, but they do offer steps on how to run the background check. They offer a free online training. So let's say you've identified that college student or that high school student who wants to care for your loved one or be a part of their care team, um, but you think that they could benefit from more training or maybe even training you can offer them, uh, this is a free resource. And you can go on here, you can download the BID, the background information disclosure, um, and you can uh, participate in the online training or if, um, others who are part of their care team can participate in the online training. That way at least you have some reassurance and some information about who's coming into your home. And um, yeah, so. They also have um, the uh, caregiver registry. So of those individuals who might have gone through the training process and they want to be open to um, help other families, they are listed here. It's too far away for me to see the drop down as to where it is, um, but they do have a caregiver registry. There it is. So I would definitely recommend if you find yourself in a situation or currently in a situation where that's a need, um, do your due diligence. Contact your ADRC. Be specific in asking for caregiver programs. You might also be interested in long-term care programs. And um, reach out and interview agencies and as well take a peek at RCAW's site. That's all I have. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay, moving on. Is there any old business? New business? And this is like on the agenda where I would give the update here. Uh, we've had a, a letter of resignation from Cheryl Hintz. Uh, she felt that she uh, needed to resign from the committee because she um, is just really overloaded with her work commitments and felt she wasn't pulling her weight with the committee. She found us uh, to be very informative, a lot of uh, in being a much needed committee. Uh, she specifically had asked to be appointed but felt that right now she couldn't do justice. So, uh, but we are staying in contact and she's got with her um, program She's got plenty of opportunity to, uh, as a platform, to help us, and we help her. So moving forward with that. Um, okay, any other new business? Under other business, upcoming community events for older adults. Julie? I don't have anything this month. Yeah. <coughs> Bryn? I don't have anything either. Mike? I don't know if it's an event, but I should point out that the uh, council meeting is going to be on the 13th, and um, I'm guessing we're going to cancel the second council meeting for December, because uh, we normally do that because staff needs very usually has that time off. 
So if you do have something to say to the city council, make sure you come do it on the 13th. Okay, and Julie? I don't have anything at this point. Oh, Jean, anything from the senior center? Um, no, just uh, we were a little light in December, but some social events that we have coming up. But uh, looking forward to another 2023 year. <laughs> okay, well, I, I do actually have a few things here. Uh, going on right now down at Menominee Park, we have the number one light show in Wisconsin. It's also been written up in Travel and Leisure magazine, uh, Celebration of Lights. If anybody hasn't been down there yet, uh, please do. It's great. Uh, senior night was um, last week or the week before. Julie's not here. Julie Mazalski's not here. They gave out these nice mugs or I'm sorry not Julie um, I'm sorry that that wasn't there that was uh, evergreen um, but they're nice metal mugs and so we most of us missed out on them <coughs> um, and community night is tonight community night is to, actually I've got the calendar here uh, there is a community night tonight uh, also on Tuesday the 13th, Friday the 16th, Tuesday the 20th, and Christmas Day. And they have special nights where there's gifts or special collections. So um, let's see where we are. Um, tomorrow night is Veterans Night. The first 200 veterans receive a free mug. Saturday is Humane Society Night, and I think they were collecting pet foods and, and things. Wednesday is the 21st, and that's where I got Julie into it, was uh, Golden Years Night, and that, I believe, is Bella Vista, Edenbrook, and Lakeshore Manor. Um, and, of course, Bella Vista has the beautiful view if they're on the east side of the building. And then Friday, December 30th, is Night of the Torches. Um, I worked on Saturday night uh, with the huts. Luckily, they're warm. They didn't used to be, uh, but it was still a very cold night. And we had somewhere between five and 600 cars go through, or vehicles go through, I think, um, including a limo mm -hmm. and a limo bus that was really <laughs> rocking. Um, and the little kids that were just so excited. Mm -hmm. And the calendars were being handed out. And how many people were coming with, um, some with just a can of soup as that extra donation, and some with grocery bags full of donations. Um, so people are really into it. And it would have been nicer if there was snow, and there's snow in the forecast. So uh, one of the things that Rick Helm said is as soon as we get that first really sticking snow, the traffic really picks up. And uh, Channel 11 is there doing a live remote this morning. So they're getting lots of coverage for that. Uh, recycling of Christmas lights. How many of us have got piles of Christmas lights <laughs> laying around that don't work? Or you got to find that one bulb, just right? One bulb. <laughs> One bulb doesn't but work. You're supposed yeah. to try to replace that first. <laughs> yeah. But um, there is a, I've got a sheet, and it'll be available online. Uh, but the city of Oshkosh has uh, two locations, the city itself sponsoring. One is right here at City Hall. There's a bin right across from the elevator. And then the field operations office um, over, uh, the address is 639 Witzel, but they say to use the Ohio Street entrance. But Lowe's and Habitat for uh, Humanity Restore also collect them. So it's just trying to keep a few more things out of the landfill. And if you've got a real Christmas tree and you're getting rid of it, check with some of the uh, fishing clubs because they use them as markers out on the lake of where the safe spots are. So. Public service announcements on that. The real ID, we've talked about that off and on for how many years now? 
and it was supposed to um, be, um, I think, early in the spring that it would be due, and there was just an extension, so it goes now to 2025. So, I, and I have an article that um, Bobby will be able to put with our minutes. And then my last one along that line of any of this is just a reminder that if schools are closed because of the weather over winter, our meetings will also be canceled. It's just a safety issue. So any questions on any of those things that I presented? No questions, but can I add one more, Judy? Because my 13-year-old is going to get mad at me if I don't mention it. The Oshkosh Youth Choir has a free concert Friday night at Oshkosh North at 7 p.m. Um, it's their holiday program, and they're doing a private one tonight at Evergreen, so they'll be nice and warmed up and practice, too. That's right. And Lessons and Carols is coming up at Trinity Episcopal Church, and I forgot the date. It's just, I don't, I don't remember if it's the... 18th I think it might be around the 18th okay um, and that that is always a big event and there's a an afternoon it used to be a, a an evening an afternoon and an evening performance and now it's it's like afternoon and five o'clock okay. um, those are both of those events are well attended oh yeah a lot of madrigal events, so. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Discussion? Okay, with that, we will adjourn. Our next meeting date is January 3rd, the new year. First day back after all the holidays. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we are all, staff are off the day before the third so just so you know Bobby won't bring in the office so at that point maybe make sure that you get the information to me it's sending it both uh, both to Bobby and to me actually I'll be gone the week before too when the meet when the agendas are oh yeah that's okay. right yeah include me in the email then okay yeah we have a lot of staff that are off so mm -hmm. but that um, that day before our meeting, if anyone is not attending, try to get that earlier because we won't have uh, you know, vacation. Be <laughs> won't be on Monday. And because of that, we won't have, any, I don't think we'll have any big speaker. We'll try to keep a little bit more updating of information. To bring a speaker out and have not have a quorum is a little bit of a challenge. Um, with that, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you for coming. Thank you.